Esther Campion is my guest today on Rights for Women, and it's a real pleasure to have Esther back on the podcast. We had Esther on, uh, I think, with her first book, and it's great to have her back now with book number three. Esther is actually from Cork in Ireland originally and currently lives in northwestern Tasmania. Her debut novel, Leaving Ocean Road, was published in July by Hachette, Australia, and it's a story set across the landscapes of Greece, Ireland and small town coastal Australia. It follows the life of Ellen O'Shea as she struggles to deal with her husband's death and an unexpected visitor from her past. Following Leaving Ocean Road, Esther published the sequel, which was The House of Second Chances in 2019. And her new release, which is actually out this week, is A, House, a Week to Remember. Um, it's a standalone, but it does feature some of the characters that we've grown to know and love in Esther's previous two books, as well as some brand new ones. Esther and her family live in Tassie uh, with an overindulged chocolate Labrador and two horses, which Esther firmly believes are living proof that dreams really do come true. Esther, it's so good to have you on the podcast again. Welcome to Rights for Women. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to be here with you, Pam. It's great. Lovely to see you too. We've got, we had a little bit of trouble getting everything connected, but we did connect finally, so that's great. Um, before we start with talk, launching into talking about your book, and I deliberately didn't give a blurb or anything for the new book, because I'm going to ask you to do that for us. I did recently see a photo of you on Instagram where you were jetty jumping and it really intrigued me and I'm imagining it would be quite chilly jumping off a jetty down there in Tasmania but can you tell us a little bit about that pastime? Well um, I've been jetty jumping since I moved to Australia um, about 13 years ago now. I lived as you know in Port Lincoln in South Australia and um, it was a great pastime there and of course I've been a swimmer all my life and you know we would do sea swimming well we were mostly you know tank swimmers but um in the summers we loved swimming together in the sea my family would go on you know holidays by the seaside and all that as teenagers we used to cycle to the beaches and stuff but um so when I came to Australia and I saw these people doing this jetty jumping I thought my word this is for me um so yes um so we've got in Tassie now, the water is absolutely fabulous. It's like Mediterranean. Okay. I tell you, I was in again last night now, not jetty jumping, but just a dip. And it's surprisingly warm. And it's probably not a good thing, the global warming and everything. But I mean, I, I must say I'm taking advantage of it. Um, but I do, I do love, love the old jetty jump. Like. <laughs> oh, that's great. And you had some really great pics on Instagram. I, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's, it's a bit mad, like, but you know, sometimes you've got to do a bit of something a bit mad, don't you? Absolutely. I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, we'll be, to begin with, Esther, before we get into um, a week to remember, could you tell us just a little bit about your publishing journey and, you know, just your writing history and your publishing journey, how you got to be where you are today? I will, of course. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't writing anything until I moved to um, Australia. Well, no, I tell a lie. I was living in Norway and I tried a correspondence course in creative writing because I I had at, at the time firmly in my mind that writing was something that you you didn't just sit down and do you had to you had to go to sort of a class and a course and, and that sort of thing um, which of course is completely untrue but I've learned since but um, then but I didn't like the correspondence course because you know there's no interaction there was no cup yeah. of tea left. it was boring as all hell so anyway I came to Australia and then I thought right we're thinking what will I do with myself now I'm getting the kids settled into kindy and schools and that and I thought well I want to put a creative writing course. I, I was wanting to do that. Maybe there's one in the in the Tate with Tate in Port Lincoln. But unfortunately, the course wasn't still running. It had run years before. But out of that course, a lovely um, writing group called Air Writers um, had formed. So I rang them up to find out, you know, where would I do this kind of course? And they said to me, oh, no, there's nothing. But look, come and join us. So I didn't want to be rude. Um, but I said, look, I'm not a writer at all, you know, but I kind of was a bit fascinated. And the lady on the phone was saying, oh, I'm writing a novel and oh, it's great fun. And I thought, <laughs> holy living God, like I can hardly write my own name. But they said, bring something to the meeting. And all I had was an email I had sent 
to some friends um, once I got to, you know, within the first week of arriving in Australia, and I was really telling them about the, the madness of the transition from, you know, minus nine in Norway to mm. um, 36 the weekend I arrived in Australia. So, and a few other incidents. And um, I was last to read at that meeting. And you know what writers groups are like. But anyway, they went around the room and you had the award winning short storytellers and you uh, writers and you had the poets, the published poets, and you had the people that were, you know, noveling away right. um, and getting very close to publication. And I read this email anyway at the end. And the president of the, the club, like the group, she nudged me and she said, You can stay. And I thought, Great, I'll be making the tea. Um, but they were the nicest group of people to me and just I kept going once a fortnight meeting um, you know they put up a challenge write a poem I'd write a poem write a short story try to write a short story they're very hard to write I take my hat mm -hmm. off to anybody who can write them me too um, and then they had these retreats for week-long retreats outside a place outside Port Lincoln and I was so envious of those people but of course, I could never go on a retreat, A, because I wasn't writing a novel. It was only for novelists. And B, because my children obviously needed to be minded. But my lovely husband said to me, why don't you go for a couple of nights and I'll mind to hold the fort like you'll be fine. And I thought, oh, isn't that lovely? And I thought, oh, there's only one problem. I've no, I'm not writing a novel. So I started throwing down an idea it had come to me in Norway. And I started writing for all my lists to save myself. And I was accepted onto this thing. And I got a place on the retreat. And I went with 11 pages and I came home. Or no, by the end of the first day, I had about 22. And I thought, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> but it was the peace. Mm. And, and, you know, that silent sort of time in a writing retreat where, um, you know, it's just you and the page. But, yeah. you know, people doing the same thing behind you in the company. and talking over things at night and I just loved I cooked and you know I'm sure that the first novel wasn't much good like but I started putting it out to publishers getting my rejections and I think somebody recently I heard on a webinar or something talking about your apprenticeship mm. and I thought wasn't that, wasn't that a lovely idea you might agree with me Pam it does take it can take years absolutely yeah and it's something you never stop learning about isn't it no you don't you don't because if, and every book then is a blank canvas yeah so you know I'm writing another one now and I'm terrified <laughs> you know there's no guarantees like just because you have three published novels that you know you're you're on to the next one and you're but you keep going if you love it yeah. you keep going absolutely you know? and was that book that you started there at that retreat was that leaving ocean road no that was my next one I okay. threw out, I, I sent a, I sent that one now to about, I think I might have got about 10 or 12 rejections, but I got a beautiful rejection from, do you remember the, do you remember the book, P.S. I Love You? Yes. By Cecilia Hearn. Yes. Well, I brazenly sent that first novel to her agent in Dublin because really? I kind of didn't know where I was. I thought, oh, well, I'm only, you know, I'm only off the boat here now, like I'm, I'm sent back home. Yeah. And she gave me the most beautiful rejection. She said, this isn't for me, but it's good women's fiction and keep writing. Good luck. Like. And I thought, oh, I have it. I have that email printed out and nearly framed. I have it in a, a notebook. Stuck yeah. in a notebook. And, you, you know, you can take it two ways. You, you can kind of go, oh, well, you know, it's not good enough. Or you can say, well, who am I to argue with Marianne Gunn O'Connor? Do you know? <laughs> um, so that was kind of the attitude I took. And I kept, I started another one then because I suppose I was just into it. I just thought, oh, sure. You know, another idea came to me, mm. wrote Leaving Ocean Road. And, um, but I did, I mean, there are people listening now, like I listen to your podcast and yeah. they are listening and hoping to glean um, the kind of helpful tips and, and tricks and things. But I tell everybody who, who wants to know my sort of um, pivotal moment really um, was my mother had given me money and you know made me swear I'd spend it within a, the year she'd given it to me on writing and 
I'd gone to um, a self-publishing workshop in the December. Like, I got to the end of the year, the beginning of December, I went to a self-publishing workshop. It, I found out it wasn't for me at all because mm. I couldn't even log on to the flipping Twitter thing they wanted us to be on. <laughs> and I was hopeless, like, really hopeless. And they got to the point, like, the two facilitators in the workshop where they were avoiding me. Oh, you know, no. I think I was that helpless that they started going to the kind of better people. So anyway, I just thought to myself, like, you know, I might as well throw in the towel, like nothing's going to work for me. But that evening, um, there was a man, Gary gave a bit of a talk and we had dinner with him afterwards, John Sheehan, he's a Tasmanian. And he mentioned um, a manuscript assessor that he'd heard of, or that he'd heard speaking at the Festival of Golden Words in Beaconsfield in Tassie that the year before or whatever. And it was Irina Dunn. And I contacted uh -huh. her and she's a manuscript assessor. And I think she'd been head of the one of the writing centres in one of the yeah, states. She used to be centers. involved with uh, Varuna, I think, and also writing New South Wales. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the bit that it was money well spent. It was a mm. lot of money. She wasn't cheap. But I just got to the point where I thought, if I don't give this over to somebody in the know and I needed somebody to tell me whether this was good enough or not because I was yeah. losing faith and she she came back to me she said yeah it is good enough put 10,000 words out with them it'll be grand so I did that and then I right. said well what do I do now and she said oh you know for another load of money like I'll send it out to a few people I know and she did that okay. and I sort of invested myself and my husband you know it was a decision are we going to invest in this and he said dear yeah. one come on you've come this far now keep going that's what I did and luckily, it landed on um, the desk of the lovely Rebecca Saunders in mm -hmm. Hachette. And yes. uh, through a bit of a roundabout thing, but it did. And that was, you know, you got the phone call and that was the break, the lucky break. Yeah, yeah. That was good. So it's I was lucky I got two, two book deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that idea of perseverance, Esther, and, and backing yourself, you know, like believing in, in what you've got and just trying another avenue you know when one doesn't work try something else yes and you know you know as, as well as anybody Pam with your own books it's it's a fairly lonely road like mm. you know and it's I don't know about anybody I can only speak for myself but like the self-doubt and the imposter syndrome and you know that's all weighs fairly heavy like yeah. um so I suppose part of what we do is trying to ignore the inner critic and just keep going yeah yeah for sure absolutely well, let's get on to talking about the new book a week to remember I've been reading it it's it's lovely and it's just your beautiful sort of cozy style that um, draws the reader in but can you tell us you know what it's about give us the blurb yeah I'll give you the blurb I can remember it um, <laughs> well it is set, I suppose, mostly in West Cork, in the southwest of Ireland, and also in the northwest of Tasmania, where I'm currently living. But um, there's a newly renovated guest house called Lizzie O's, and it's taking in its first guests um, for a week in the Irish winter um, that none of them will forget. So mm -hmm. I, as usual, I've got a bit of an ensemble of characters, um, sort of main characters and supporting characters in the community. And I've got a couple, Mick and Ashling Fitzgerald, who are going to celebrate a wedding anniversary. Um, they've been gifted by their family. They're living, they're Irish, but they're living in Tasmania. And they go along and then his mother, comes to Tassie to look after the children and kind of house it and that. Um, so her, her storyline develops um, sort of alongside that of her daughter-in-law and son. So um, then I have a, a, a dentist, Declan, who is probably the, the grumpiest, well, yeah described him as grouchy actually she read um, an early copy and she said I love your grouchy characters but I was a bit challenged by writing them because you know it's quite easy for me to write nice people yeah you know, yeah but, 
<laughs> no, you did a great job of making Declan grouchy, I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So he's there and he's had a marriage breakup and he, his, um, his uh, practice manager thinks it's a good idea if he sort of, you know, has a bit of a holiday, probably trying to get rid of him for a week. Yeah. And he goes down there, but he has roots down there, which he has probably forgotten. Um, and then who else do I have? Oh, I have Katie um, Daly. She's a very important character she's been away from the village for about 35 years um after a traumatic um sort of time and she's returning home because her sister begs her to mind the mother the the aging mother and um, because the sister is after meeting somebody she's got the opportunity to go to spain for a week so um, Katie sort of begrudgingly agrees to return to look after the mother um, and is, has to face this past that she's mm. run away from in the first place. Um, and who else have I then? Oh, I Mia? Mia. Mm. Mia. Mia Montgomery. Uh, she's there um, and she hasn't told her husband she's there. So she slips away for a bit of an escape of her own mm-hmm. um, to sort a few things out about her marriage yeah. and without telling Harry. Yeah. So you sort of put the characters into this almost like a pressure cooker, isn't it? You know, they're all thrown together. These people that don't know each other, some of them like Ashling and Mick have their own problems going on, you know, without even dealing with the other characters who are there. But then, of course, well, they all have their own issues. Um, and then putting them all together, it almost like accentuates, you know, their own conflicts, doesn't it? But it also allows them to play off each other and to share things and learn from each other in this, this beautiful setting of this um, guest house that you've created. And I could really visualise, you know, it's newly decorated because it's it's just been fixed up and renovated. And I love the way that you sort of describe all that. But the characters are sort of really... Um, almost forced together aren't they in this setting which which then triggers off a whole lot of other things happening for them they are definitely Pam and the thing about it is like when they get there first they're um they're not there to to make friends really you know and to yeah. kind of have the, the, the partying of a night you know but of course the way it's set up is um there's a conservatory at, which is a di- the dining area and it's got the um, communal the dining mm. table so they all they're all forced to that's where they have to sit of an evening to have dinner yeah. um because dinner is is prepared um by the lovely ellen and jerry um so i suppose they're all holding back and trying to sort out their own stuff yeah. um yes yeah. but inevitably um there there, there are connections made between the different um characters around the table yeah it's sort of it's very relatable I think because I think we've all been in that situation it could be a weekend away at a guest house like you say or a motel type setup or it could just be a restaurant you know when you walk in and there's only the communal table left and sometimes you just don't want to have to talk to people and then you're yeah. sort of forced to sit down and, and be sociable and be friendly and and you find that it does you know your barriers do generally break down so it's interesting to watch the way the barriers break down for these characters mm-hmm. to a greater or lesser extent as well but how did you manage Esther you have got quite a lot of characters and storylines going on in the writing of this book how did you sort of manage that do you just start with one character and go and see what happens and then introduce the others how do you do that structurally yes that's exactly how I do it I mean I'm very much um a pantser pan you know with the writing by the seat of the pants sort of technique um but uh, I actually started that book with uh Mia Montgomery Okay. Um, even though the book doesn't open, I think the book opens with Ashling mm, on, yeah, yes. on the beach having a walk with their friend, yeah, in Tassie, yeah. uh, still in Tassie. Um, but yeah, I started with Mia, and then I suppose, like as it went on, I just moved kind of scenes and people around and and stuff like that. But the editing was brilliant um, from Hachette, the publishers. You know, I mm. had fabulous editing help. But of course, editing you've got to you've got to have a bit of a thick skin because you know. Yeah 
you know, put in the book and then there's, in my case, I mean, I remember going to a writing retreat and, and my friends were there were saying, you know, what are you writing, Esther? And of course I was saying, well, you know, I've got this jumble of characters, you know, <laughs> and they were saying, but that's okay. Like you said, you always have a jumble of characters, you know? And I was like, well, but this is a real jump. But I think I ended up killing a couple of darlings because um, there was a lot going on. But to be fair, I like that, you know, yeah. in my yeah. imagination. I like the kind of the buzz and the, you know, who's, you know, I love the supporting characters, like yeah. the character there, I don't know if you remember Orla. Yes. Um, you know, different, th these different characters, mm -hmm. like a couple of teenage girls belong to the neighbor up the road in Tassie, you know, these yeah. people. They're all part of it for me. Like and it's all world building, isn't it? Almost. It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the editors were very much like, come on, Esther, there's a limit to what the reader can take. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> calm down. Like. <laughs> and, um, but I suppose just you're better off, you know, having, having more and being able to cut back in the rewrite than, than the adding on. You know, I suppose yeah. that's, you know, practically... Yeah, it's not it's a bad like, thing to, to sort of reminds me of like a tapestry, you know, and you have your big main pieces, which you have your characters, and then you've got all these little smaller interconnecting pieces, you know, but it's all part of one whole. Um, mm. I enjoyed that about the book. That's really good because yeah. that's what I loved writing. I love writing the kind of community that we ended up with, like, you know, it's good. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's set in, as you say, both Tasmania and Western Cork. Um, yeah. And we've been to that particular setting in, in Cork before because it's the it's the guest house that Ellen and Jerry did up, isn't it? Exactly right. Yes, Ellen and Jerry um, uh, got the um, the Ellen's friend Colette Barry, an interior designer, mm. and Ellen's brother Aidan O'Shea uh, to renovate the house. So it's the O'Shea family home mm. um which the which is is now called lizzie o's um in memory of the grandmother yeah so this is where the the, the action is set yeah and was it is it do you love going back into that setting each time you know when even though this is a standalone book you know you are going back to that setting and revisiting some familiar characters is it sort of like you know meeting up with old friends again for you but it, it is. And like, you know, last year when COVID hit, like I was really grateful that I had this imaginary kind of story going on, you know, mm -hmm. because I think it's important as a writer to to kind of fall in love with your characters mm -hmm. and, you know, really invest. And well, I suppose we do that as writers. Um, but I kind of described it, COVID was a weird for everybody. And I felt that some people were busting a gut like the essential workers and they were doing over and above. And then you had other people that didn't know what to do with themselves. And then you had people that were like doubling up at home, working from home and yeah. kids and oh gee. Um, but I felt with the writing, I felt very fortunate because it was a bit business as usual. I could keep on with yeah. the writing um well it would, would have been the rewriting I suppose at that stage of the book um but it was a great comfort and I kind of felt it was like yeah you know when you unzip a tent and you get into the tent and then you zip it back up behind you and you're in <laughs> kind of <laughs> it's a bit of a cocoon so yeah I I loved I loved that you know yeah good. and the whole I mean somebody asked me recently if I get home very often and I actually don't um, I'd love to. I'd love to get home more often. Of course, nobody's going anywhere at the moment. But um, that uh, it's very important to me. Yeah. To to tap into these places and mm. revisit them, even in terms of imagination. Yeah. And that setting, Esther, in Ireland, where the book is largely set, is that where you come from yourself, or a place that you're very familiar with? I'm guessing so. No. You know, I oh, don't yeah. come from there, and I'd say they'll absolutely murder me if they if they find out. You know, I'm writing about their <laughs> place, like because um, I I tell you how exactly I I fell in love with that place. 
when I was in university, I, I'm from Cork City. Right. And it's very important when you're in Ireland to kind of say you're from the city because you'd be very proud to be from the city, do you know? Okay. But anyway, <laughs> definitely not, I don't know whether it's a global university thing or an Irish thing, but anyway. Um, so I was in uni and this friend of mine, their, her parents had a, a caravan in West Cork, in this place called Haven that I write about. And she invited me down for a weekend. Now, it was bedlam in the caravan because there was about five of them kids. She was the eldest. So they were all going down from her. And we were only probably first or second year uni students. And the parents in the caravan, big, long thing. We call it a mobile home okay. in Ireland. Yeah. But it doesn't go anywhere because it's on a load of bricks and it stays there. But anyway, that's another story. So I went there and oh, I thought it was the best crack ever. Like, there's only myself and my sister in my family. So this big family and the caravan it was like all a bit hilarious for me and I thought it was brilliant and I'd say I was never so quiet you know in my life um because there was so many talking and yeah. so much going on I loved it so then the parents were kind enough when myself and my now husband had our first child they said to us one time would you go down to Crookhaven and take the caravan for a week or whatever or, yeah and I, because they they renovated a house in the town, um, in the village. So of course we happily went down with our baby and had a beautiful, beautiful time. Uh -huh. um, and every time I go back home, I take a trip down there. I've introduced my sister, my mother, my nephew to the place, and my own children. And we might just go down and you know sit down on the pier on a nice day, buy a sandwich, eat the sandwiches across the sea, might have a dip, of course, I'd yep. have to have a dip, myself yep. and my sister had a dip the last time. Um, but yes, I I absolutely love the place, very special to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it comes through, I think, that that love of the place and, and the, in the setting and in the way you write. And I think you've got a little piece you're going to read for us, Esther, of just some part of the guest house or the setting there. Because I wanted everybody to be able to hear Esther re you reading this in your lovely accent. Because oh, your Irish you. look definitely comes through in the writing. It's beautiful. Okay, so I'm actually reading from chapter six. I'm trying not to give anything away. Yeah. This is just a little piece about Katie Daly, one, one of the main characters. Miss Daly. Katie opened her eyes and dragged herself up straight and out of her slumber in the back seat of the car, where she must have nodded off soon after she'd been picked up at Cork Airport. With her eyes adjusting to the weak afternoon sunlight, she took in the farmhouse with the green door and mused over the old myth as to what secrets lay beyond. Her spine tingled. The house didn't need to have secrets. She had enough of her own. As her driver got out, a woman appeared in the doorway, wrapping a loose fitting sweater around her, holding it together with one hand while giving a friendly wave with the other. If she thought this was cold, Katie thought, she should try one of their winters in the States. The smell hit her the moment the driver opened the door, a salty mix of freshness and the spoils washed up from the ocean. Her head spun at the assault on her senses. Between the naked branches of the tree-lined garden, she glimpsed the slate grey sea. Tears smarted at the corners of her eyes, unexpected tears. Perhaps this was a mistake, coming here after all these years, almost unravelling within the first 30 seconds. No, she was stronger than that. Planting her feet on the driveway, she took a deep breath and vowed to get through this week unscathed by memories from a lifetime ago. You've got the best room of all, the friendly woman in wool was telling her. I'm Ellen. Yes, they corresponded by email. As they shook hands, the woman touched Katie's elbow. You must be exhausted, she said, looking at her as if she were about to fall down. Come on and I'll show you where you are. Katie smiled inwardly. She knew exactly where she was, but Ellen O'Shea didn't need to know. She let her lead the way. 
acknowledging a certain intrigue as to what had become of the old O'Shea family home. Thank you, Esther. That was a really great piece to select too. And I, I had a, I found Katie a really poignant character, actually. She, you know, she's in this situation where she's in a place she really doesn't want to be, but she's got this family obligation. And did you, when you were writing, you know, we did say there, there's a lot of characters here for you to write and develop. Did you have any that you were sort of drawn to more than others and, and any that were difficult for you to, to develop the way that you wanted to? Well, Katie would be a case in point, definitely, um, because I felt that, you know, some themes around the about of around her character mm -hmm. development as I got to know her and sort of worked out what had happened to her, why she had been away for so long. Um, I found that um, challenging, but also a, um, quite interesting to mm. explore um so without giving in any spoilers away I suppose um you know I was reflecting on something that had happened to Katie in the um 80s um and you know also within that I uh, you know it was things that were happening in Ireland at the time mm. um, to do with uh, cultural mores and norms and related to the Catholic Church and the, the sort of stranglehold that that had over yeah. people and the way we sort of um, treated women and girls. Um, uh, yeah, so that was important to me to grapple with. Um, uh, that was a sort of, uh, and that actually started me when I began the book. I felt I had read around these issues and, you know, took that very seriously on the yeah. journey through, through, through the book. Because yeah. I like to write humor, I like to write funny things and light sort of, you know, scenes and things. Um, but definitely, I find myself drawn to the or this time around and definitely well and previous books as well that's the kind of heavier the you know somebody said to me the dark with the light yeah you know, and I think that's what life's about really you know it it's is. not all sweetness and light mm. Mm. I think it helps the readers relate to the characters too and and like you say having those secrets or something in the past that you know you don't reveal up front you've got to keep reading to find out what it is that they're, they're keeping secret what it is that they're hiding or feeling uncomfortable about and I think that's part of drawing the reader in too isn't it mm, definitely Declan how do you know you mentioned him before as, as you know maybe not such a nice character he's a little bit sleazy isn't he at times a little bit of a you know likes to yeah. ogle the women and things how did you go writing him because he's he does come across as a really interesting character well, I'm so glad you say that because he appeared in the, the previous novel in the House of Second Chances, and he was one of the ones that one of the editors recommended I cut. And, you know, as bad as he was, I didn't want to cut him and I didn't. I held on to him in that book. And I thought, I'm going to give him a lovely big part in this. Yeah. No. I'm yeah. just going to see what I can do with him, really, <laughs> um, because he's an awful idiot in the beginning. You know, he's um, he is misogynistic and um, yeah. oh, he's a desperate lifestyle, you know, ordering Uber Eats and drinking too much red wine, mm. and, you know, as you say, a bit of a sleaze. Um, but there's a, there's a heart in there, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's not all bad. Yeah. Um, so we I, I did. I definitely. I definitely loved um, writing him, and and in particular, you know, he's he's one of these people who shows up there and you know can't be bothered with, you know, really, you know, he's not into the the deep and meaningful or anything like that. That's not what he went there for. But um, he does strike up a bit of a connection with Mick, the the guy who comes from Tasmania, and I loved um. I loved writing that relationship yeah, and how that friendship. Um, yeah. 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 How between two men, I don't, mm. I don't know if that's something I had written that before or, or as in depth anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel that you were sort of exploring different sorts of issues or going deeper into some issues in this novel, Esther, than you have in your previous ones? 
Um, I, I think the, 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 the probably the particular issues that I chose challenged me more, mm. for sure. Um, and I, I feel this, that there's a kind of, um, there's a braveness required, the kind of a courage required um, when you're writing about the, these issues because, you know, you're talking about, you know, the relatability of, of books and, and characters. But I think there, that there then is a responsibility to deal with mm. issues in a certain way as well, um, in a kind of a, a careful way, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I did definitely. Um, I just enjoyed the opportunity of writing about things close to my heart mm. at times. And um, yeah, just things that, that are important to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that's one of the privileges of writing. Um, well, I mean, I only write fiction, but, um, you know, just teasing out some of those issues and how painful they can be for people, but also the, um, you know, the themes around reconciliation and in particular, well, yeah, exactly, forgiveness. Do you yeah, know? yeah. And um, human kindness, these sorts of, you know, um, traits that I suppose somewhere we all, we all have deep down. Yes. And some people you have to dig a bit deeper to find them, but they're there. Yeah. Yeah. Some people yeah. you're mining for them. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think you do a lovely job of that. Um, I wanted to ask you, you have a cover quote from Kathy Kelly and who is one of the most popular women's fiction authors probably going around has been for some time. And your stories have been likened to those of Maeve Binchy and Monica McInerney. How do you feel about those sorts of comparisons? <laughs> a bit terrified <laughs> to be quite honest I mean you know like for me um I I um I don't think I read a Monica McInerney until I'd moved to Australia but certainly and I love Mac Monica McInerney's books in particular The House of Memories oh I just love that mm -hmm. book but anyway um Maeve Binchy would have been a household name, of course, in Ireland. Yes. Um, I remember my mother having a copy of Light a Penny Candle, um, which came out in 1982 when I would have been um, in my teens. Um, so she was very much like a larger than life character yeah. in Ireland. Um, so, you know, to be in my 40s and now my my 50s and to be for my writing to be compared to hers I just find that you know phenomenal I mean I I absolutely will say you know there will never be another Maeve Binchy but to come anywhere close mm. um for readers in terms of the enjoyment they get out of the books is is just for me it's absolutely amazing Brilliant. I'm so grateful. Yeah, it must be amazing. It must be a huge honour to be in that, you know, put into that genre, I guess, into that box with those authors who you've read and loved, you know, and and a great way for you, I guess, to sort of see where your books fit too in terms of readership, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. And, I mean, you know, I was talking earlier on about... Um, you know the blank canvas and and you know being terrified every time you you start a new book um well at least i am but um you know kind of beside that is is that kind of encouragement you mm. know and that the, the honor of being mentioned in the same sentence as these people yeah. and the, the encouragement that, that that you can take from that um i mean i just um was thinking of Kathy Kelly you mentioned Kathy Kelly earlier and I just you know I clicked her an email this morning just to say thanks a million you're staying with my books you know and she's on the, the, the cover of this one again her lovely quote um are just a phenomenal uh writer and she, her 21st book is coming out in April wow and I'm this is my third yeah and I just think wow like you know I just 
feel very like unworthy. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep genuine. going, keep going. You've only got what eighteen more to yeah. go. <laughs> bit, of, bit of catching up to do, definitely. <laughs> Oh no, but it's great, as you say, it's sort of inspiration, isn't it, for us to keep keep going. Air it is, air it yeah. is. I think you just have to keep going. I mean, like, you know, you can look at it two ways. Is it inspiration or is it desperate pressure altogether? But yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely. Now let's go with the inspiration, I think. Definitely. Um, so just before we start wrapping up, what do you what have been for you the best things about having your books published? And what have been any some of the challenges, if any? that you found in being a published author? Uh, well, the best thing ever about being a published author is the connections to uh, people generally, um, but in particular, people uh, that like I would have been close to, you know, maybe when I was in my teens and my twenties and that, that have kind of do you know, we've we've got this thing now, like to kind of connect us. Not that we did, we ever needed that really, but um, I just love that. I love the, and even people I don't know, just nice. You know, people say nice things about you. Like, I mean, I think the world needs, you know, the kind mm. of that kind of encouragement that we we give each other. You know, yeah. um, I think it's a lovely thing, uh, and um. Yeah, I, that's the, the nicest thing is connecting with people is absolutely above everything. Yeah. Um, you know, the conversation we're having now, I mean, you and I met at um, a Romance Writers of Australia conference did, a few years in Adelaide ago. Late, a few years ago, yeah. you know. And it's those sort of kind of moments where you kind of like a touch point um, where you meet somebody that you you connect with and you you're kind of like a bit like minded you're doing a similar thing yeah. um and then but you don't get the option but this is giving us an opportunity to reconnect which which is lovely right yeah um so any particular challenges of being a published author i think um definitely the the kind of the, the pressure to to, to to produce another book or another mm -hmm. you know but I think as you said you know and you know I was saying earlier a lot of that is in your own head I think you know the most important thing about writing is to just sit down and do it really like and get over yourself you know <laughs> <laughs> for sure yeah and you said you are working on another book at the moment I am I am I'm fairly, fairly the early stages I'm you know at the like and this is the other thing I mean comparing yourself to other people I mean I could be you know sitting here and say oh man you know it's terrible I should have another one kind of drafted by now or whatever but I mean that just you know it doesn't help you it doesn't help me anyway so yeah. um I am tipping away as ever I am contracted uh, for another book I'm very happy yeah. I would do, do, do two two book deals so far and this fourth novel is it's in the works it's in the pipeline brilliant that's exciting not, not not saying too much about it probably because i don't actually know too much about <laughs> it <yet. laughs> early days yeah for sure well esther i've really enjoyed reading a week to remember and i know that people who have loved your earlier books are going to love it and anybody who loves just a, a lovely warm cozy read with great characters um interesting life situations and that just seeing what happens when you put a whole bunch of strangers together and, and see where where they end up and where they you know what happens to them all I think it's um it's a wonderful premise it's it's really great thank you and, and thanks a million for the opportunity oh no it's lovely to chat to you where would you recommend people find the book I think it is out this week is that right it's actually out tomorrow tomorrow okay so we're recording on Monday yeah the 22nd so it's out on the 23rd so this this episode uh, comes out on Friday so it'll be out so you can find it I'm guessing in bookshops online is it on audio as well well I'm absolutely thrilled because this is the first book that will be on audio so oh, it's brilliant it's on audible and it's on something else is it on Kobo or something but anyway have a google and it should come up um also the hachette website is a good place to go or my facebook page or yep. instagram yeah okay and you haven't been hit by the facebook gremlins you haven't lost your page oh or... listen that's a ridiculous debacle altogether that's an awful thing yeah desperate well i'm i'm touching wood really because mm -hmm. it could it could be any of us 
Mm. Yeah, well, the Rights for Women page is gone on Facebook. So um, I'm just in the process of trying to retrieve that. And hopefully they will realise it's not, a, you know, a news broadcasting page as such. So we will see yeah, what happens. Luck, Pam, Thank because you. It's such a fabulous site, you know, goes into, well, I mean, you know, I'm not pushing myself up here, but the, I've got a lot of um, sort of encouragement, really, and uh, tips and just the kind of um oh yeah that happens to me sort of yeah. moment and and the lovely insights into books that you, you wouldn't get you know I think it's like in particular yeah. Monica, Monica McInerney's interview about the godmothers I loved that I haven't read it yet but I love that interview so things like that yeah really yeah helpful. oh thanks Esther I'm glad that you're getting so much out of it and of course the the podcast itself hasn't been affected it's just the disseminating the information via the Facebook page, you know, but it, it's on Instagram and, and the website, of course, is great to have. But thank you. It's good to know that you're getting something out of the podcast. So it's been fabulous to talk to you. Where can people can find you on Facebook? Are you also on Instagram and, and where else would they find you? I'm, I'm only on Facebook and Instagram. I find <laughs> it's probably enough for yeah. me anyway. Yeah. Plenty to manage. Okay, well, Plenty. all the best with the book. I hope it just goes flying off the shelves for you and it's been so lovely to chat. Thanks a million. Thanks so much, Pam. See ya. Thank you. Bye.